Somewhere in the mountains of Chihuahua, Mexico, two skulls were discovered by a girl in a mine tunnel. One looked normal, but the other felt and looked completely different. She kept them a whole life in secret, but then in the 1990s, willed them to a couple in El Paso, Texas. The recipient, Melanie Young, was a neonatal nurse at the time, and recognized that the skull was not your average human deformity. She contacted Lloyd Pye. Lloyd, a researcher in aspects of human origins, was particularly well known for his work with skulls. For the past 11 years, Lloyd has been heading research efforts to determine what caused the unusual shape and properties of the bone. The star child is a real, true bone skull that has human characteristics, but is not entirely human. Its bone is half as thick, it weighs half as much in your hand, and yet we've found that it's two to three times more durable. It is more durable for two reasons. Number one, its biochemistry is more like tooth enamel than regular bone. That's the first. But woven through the matrix of the bone, we have found that there is a network of fibers of some kind that we don't, we don't really know what they are, we just know that they're woven into the matrix of the bone and they're very durable. And these fibers are unlike anything found in any other bone on earth. They're very unique. Um, science should be extremely interested in these, but to date there's been no interest at all that I'm aware of. It starts there, then it has two dozen major physiological differences from human. You can see the eye sockets are different, the bridge of the nose is different, the cheekbones are much smaller, the, all human beings have a knot at the rear of the lower part of your head, it's called the Indian. The star child is completely missing that. Its neck connects way down here, right on top of its frame and magnum opening, meaning that its neck is about half the size of a normal human neck. Its chewing muscles are represented by this area here, normally they're up here and it's about half the, the volume of the chewing muscles of uh, a normal human. It completely lacks frontal sinuses, where, which take up a pretty good space back here in, inside the skull. No frontal sinuses at all. Much shallower eye sockets than humans have. Humans go about that much, about two inches. This goes less than an inch in its deepest part. And how old would you guess that it was when it died? We have no way to know that. We just know that it was up into its adult years because its teeth, the two teeth that we had, we have one now, we gave up one to testing, but the two teeth that we had were clearly well-worn in the way that an adult would wear them. Children can't wear their teeth to that degree. And the roots of the one that we extracted were very heavy roots, and children don't have heavy roots to their teeth. Their, their teeth, their roots dissolve so that their teeth can come out and new teeth can come in. So you have adult teeth stuck in this piece of maxilla that we have, but we also have teeth up in the maxilla waiting to come down. But just to give people in general a, a kind of a look, a kind of a concept of how it might have looked, we, we had this created. It's too big. I mean, there's no doubt that it's too big. It's as small as we could get it made, but still too big. But it gives you a sense of how it might have looked with a lower face attached. The results uncovered by Lloyd's team ruled out all known deformities and presented the scientific community with a bone profile never before seen on Earth. As we began to, to um, gather these physiological differences, all of which pointed away from human, and began to sh you know, show them to experts and say, you know, what do you think about this? They would just say, doesn't matter. It absolutely doesn't matter. You can show us. One guy said to me, Lloyd, I don't care if you stack up 10,000, 10,000 differences. I can still say to you that nature could do it. But I could see that, that it wasn't going to go anywhere like this. It had to be DNA. DNA is the only tool, the only weapon that they respect because DNA is, is math turned into biology. In 203, we finally got a DNA test done, an ancient DNA test that we could count on because the skulls are 900 years old and they require very special handling to recover um, the DNA. We could recover its mitochondrial DNA, which comes strictly from the mother and floats in the cytoplasm outside the nucleus. Nuclear DNA goes after 
the DNA inside the nucleus, which comes from both the mother and the father. But we already knew from the mitochondrial recovery that it was, an, number one, it was an easy recovery, and number two, the mother is human. So we know that the package, some part of the package in the nucleus comes from the mother. So all we have to do is if the father is a human, we know that the primers of that era of 2003, the primers were going to recover, and that would have been it. End of star child, it's a deformity, and that's it. But in six full attempts, and, and really it should have come up in the first, or at the most the second, Cer certainly not six. We did six to just be sure there could be no mistake. But in each case, no recovery. There is something seriously wrong with the father's DNA relative to a normal human being. In early 2010, a team of geneticists applied a new DNA recovery technique known as shotgunning to the star child's missing nuclear DNA. With this new technology, small strings of the nuclear base pairs were recovered, as seen in this gel sheet. But what does all of this mean? For the first time, this gel sheet verifies beyond any degree of doubt that some of the nuclear DNA seen in the gel sheet is from a human being. However, when the DNA was run through the National Institute of Health database, the largest such collection of coherent base pairs in the world, significantly, some of the star child's DNA was not found in the database, which means it has never been seen before on this planet. The final step will be the complete genome recovery and full analysis of the results. Lloyd believes those will prove conclusively, beyond any degree of possible doubt, that at least once, 900 years ago, a human-alien hybrid existed on our planet. With uh, technology produced by a company called 454 Life Sciences in Branford, Connecticut. They have developed a technique that allows the, the full recovery of, of an entire genome, or most of it. So we're going to know very precisely, after this test is completed, where the star child lays against these other species on Earth. And we're going to know how far away, precisely, it is from the norm. And once we know that, we're going to be able to say without any, I think, any possibility of doubt that it's not a human, that it's an alien-human hybrid, and I don't know how else you can call it. I don't know what other word you need to use. The, the process that will lead to the final test is that basically we have to raise the money to both do the test, carry it out, and film it in the process because there will be no more carefully scrutinized test of anything probably ever than this if we get the result that we anticipate getting and for that you will get 60 to 90 percent of recovery of the entire genome based on the quality of the sample and we think we can provide a very good sample based on what we did in 2003 as a very good clear clean sample. Well, if it, if it proves to be more alien than human, human as I, I think it's going to do, it's really going to change the history of the world. It's going to change science dramatically. It has to, that aspect of it that deals with these kind of things. But the important thing I think that it gives us, the, the most important thing that I think that it gives us is a beginning to toward finding or determining where we actually come from and how we're actually here. Because I don't think we can plot a path into the future, an accurate path into the future, until we are confident and know where we came from. And I think that the star child represents the kind of knowledge that is going to allow us to open our eyes to our actual true beginnings as a species here on this planet. And I think that will allow us to chart a path into the future where we will take a place with other beings that are out there, and I do believe that they're out there, and I think this is the, the wedge, this is the opening wedge toward moving us in a, true, a path to our true destiny among the stars.